Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh. Wow. Whew. Good. Full house. All right. Marty. Yes. Marty. Yeah. How long have we lived? Oh. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> amazing. Oh, my goodness. Um, this will not be a, um, a journey down memory lane because someday you and I will do that for the DGA oh, without, yes. without any movie to accompany. That would be great. That'd and because be great. we love doing that just ourselves. But in the meantime, I, I just want to start by saying that, you know, for me, this is just an exceptional experience watching your film. And, I, and, and, and you know how I feel about all of your films, but this one stands out uh, in a way for me that's so impactful. Uh, it's, it's an epic journey, but it's not a Hollywood epic for me. It's a humanitarian epic. I think you demonstrated such sensitivity to the Osage customs, their spoken language, their music, their deep faith in Wakanda, beginning with you know the first opening scene where they hold up the berry pipe and they put it down and then the oil rises as the pipe goes into the ground. Uh, and the irony that Osage means the chosen people of chance, which turns out to be with the discovery of oil, both a blessing and a curse. And, and your direct involvement with the uh, Osage um, throughout the making of this film, I think reflects such a foundation of trust that happened I believe with your association with Chief Standing Bear yes. and, and, and the Osage survivor community. And can you speak a bit to all of us about that? Well, we, we, uh, when I saw the, uh, when I was presented the book and the script, I immediately, immediately, um, my first reaction was, this has to be right with the Native American groups in this story. Um, otherwise, I can't, even begin to think about how to make it. And once they understood that, I said, it's gotta be straight. I mean, you can't, we have to find out what this is, who they are, what the culture, d delve into the culture, the spirituality, all of that, the rituals and all that, um, which ultimately, I was very, very concerned because I didn't really know as much. I, um, I, I had an encounter in the early 70s with um, the Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, I was there for two days, um, 1974, and you know I was this kid from Lower East Side, New York. I had just made Mean Streets. I was editing. Alice doesn't live here anymore, you know. And I had no idea. I didn't understand the. Uh, I was t 31, I think, but I did not understand going on like six. But I, <laughs> I didn't really understand the, um, uh, the, 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 the. the situation, really, with uh, the native, uh, native uh, indigenous population. I didn't get it until I got there. Mm -hmm. And it was a traumatic experience. It was um, something that was pretty shocking to me. Um, it was pretty rough. Uh, had a lot to do with um, wounded knee, you know? And I never forgotten it. It stayed with me for years. Uh, and it went, on, it went on for a couple of weeks, too. It wasn't just in Pine Ridge, something else going on. And stayed with me for years, and I kept being more, I, I'm more and more um, fascinated by the Native American culture and the First Nations in Canada. And so um, when I saw this material, I said, uh, first of all, <laughs> let's make sure it's okay, you know? And, and on that basis, I was taken out to Oklahoma. And this is the thing, Steve, you know, I come from uh, downtown New York. Uh, now it's very chic, the area I grew up in, but then it wasn't. Then it was like, you know, the Bowery with Wallace Beery and George Raft, you know? That was the Bowery, I was on the Bowery, you know, and, and, um, and now the Bowery's chic, but what I'm getting at is that it was all angular, it was all hallways, long hallways with one light bulb, you know? I don't go, when I go to Oklahoma, the prairies, wide open spaces, I mean, I, you, you start to even, you, you start to think differently, you look differently, you know? You hear things differently, and so, um, I was. I had some apprehension upon meeting um, Chief Standing Bear and, and uh, his group, uh, but when I got to Pahuska, 
which is the, the main town of the um, Osage Nation. Uh, we went in their office there, there he was, and his wife Julie and Addie Roanhorse and uh, Chad Renfro and a couple of other people. And I, I assumed that it would be a very uh, simple uh, beginning, uh, uh, kind of introductory meeting. Instead, it was two and a half hours. Mm. And I think, Steve, the thing about it was that, of course, they knew that the film was going to be made, but when they heard I was making it because the association with the underworld films I made. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, I have made a few. Uh, <laughs> Uh, four or five of them uh, out of the 28, whatever, 27. But the point is that they, they are violent, they're strong that way, uh, okay. So what they were concerned about was the violence and how I would portray it. And also, really, uh, that's, that was one aspect. But primarily, it was about, um, it was about our trust. Mm -hmm. uh, where are you coming from, you know? And I gave them a copy of Silence the film I made in uh, Taiwan. And uh, luckily, uh, um, Margie Burkhart, who is uh, Ernest Burkhart's, the character Leo plays, his great-granddaughter, she had seen Silence. Mm -hmm. And she goes, no, this, don't, don't get this wrong. There's something else going on here. I think this guy means it, <laughs> you know? And so it really was, for the first two and a half hours, we were, we became, it was very relaxed, and we became, we began to accept or they began to accept that maybe they could trust me. Now, I don't know what that means, well, I, meaning did I come up to their expectations um, and, and be, be, be as, 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 what's the word, mm, do justice to the rest of the story also, whether you're white or Native American, that sort of thing? Um, I, I don't know, I came as close as I could. But, but you, know, they, you know, did they, had they read the book because oh, in, yes. the, in the David Grand book, you know, there's much more emphasis on the F formation of the FBI I know, through Jaeger Hoover yeah, than yeah. the final movie. Did the, were the early drafts more skewered toward the FBI, and then you you well you, totally you, Eric Eric Roth and I yeah we, you we rearranged doing, it yeah. so it was more about the Osage. Yeah. Well, when I got there and I saw I, I got to know uh, Chief Standing Bear and, and and his his people there with um, Addy and a number of others. It's a silly thing, but I became to 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 say in a way, but. Um, I became comfortable there mm -hmm. uh, with them and the world around them. Um, we worked on the script for, for a number of years because I was also making Irishman. I uh, just finished it. It's a, then we got hit with COVID. But th the problem, Steve, is the Western. The problem is that I love the Western genre, as you do. Mm -hmm. I grew up on it, and you did too. It ended with Peck and Puzz, Wild Bunch. Mm -hmm. That was the end of that world, in a way. It's a new world. The, the Western has to be something else. So there's no way I could do a Western. You know, I never saw myself doing, going anywhere near a Hawks or Ford or Bedecker or any of those guys. And so for me, I had to find, I found that by pursuing the story from the point of view of the Bureau of Investigation, right. guy gets off the train, he's got beautiful boots, tilt up, he's got that Stetson, has that great tie, he looks around, and goes into town and tries to figure out what's going on and who did it. And number one, it isn't who did it, it's who didn't do it. <laughs> the whole town, everybody, we're all complicit in this. We really are, we're complicit, we're standing here now. You know, I feel that, I feel we're all complicit in what's happened um, and how the country was formed, our culture, everything. So that's number one. Number two, having Leo play that part. I would tilt up from the boots, go to his face, he walks into town, he says nothing. But we never worked that way. Right. You know what I mean? And I've seen it right. before. I've seen it, and I, I kind of see it. And I, I saw it that it was more like a, a Randolph Scott or, or um, well, you know, early uh, Clint Eastwood, quite honestly. What, right. what can I give? What can I, what can I find in the story of the Osage that is from the point of view of the men who don't live there coming in mm -hmm. at a certain point? And, then, and so what we did learn was that from these big dinners we had with the Osage, where people get up and talk about what happened to their grandfathers. By the way, apparently, the, the generations, uh, the new generation, uh, the, the recent generation, I should say, the generation before, never talked about this. And so all this was open. And naively, I thought they all talked about it. And I, no, it was all kept quiet until the book came out. And now they knew the film was gonna be made. 
And so they started getting up and telling stories about that grandfather who got killed, so and so got killed. Because and I think 60 Osage were murdered. Um, eventually, most of those were unsolved. Yes, no, not the, uh, never investigated. You know, forget it. It's, uh, I, well, the, the one that got up was Margie Burkhardt when she said, you have to remember one thing, and this dinner, this big dinner, she said that her great, great grandfather, Ernest, and Molly were in love. Mm. And I, that stayed with me. And as we're coming, we're trying to do the story from the point of view of, of the guys coming in from the, the FBI and scenes with Hoover, and I said, I've seen this before. It's good. It was great. We went, also, we went into the past of the Texas Rangers. It was really interesting. I was really, really tempted. But then we lost the heart of it. And, and at one point, Leo looked at me and said, where's the heart of the movie? Where's the heart? And I said, the heart is in Molly and you. Molly and Ernest, right, really. Right. And um, I, I didn't say you because at that point, he was still, we were still thinking of him playing t um, the, the Tom FBI. White. Yeah. yeah. So he looked at me and said, what if I play Ernest? I said, okay. <laughs> okay, if you play Ernest, we take script, rip open. Um, and instead of from the outside in, we're going from the inside out. And we're like on the ground, and scene after scene would be relentless. You know, uh, right. until, as you say, until, the, uh, <clears throat> until Jesse Plemons arrives. Right, right. And when, when Jesse Plemons arrives, uh, what arrives with him is the hope of justice. And for me, what arrived with <clears throat> Ernest was I kept hoping for Ernest. I kept praying and hoping that he didn't know the insulin was laced with arsenic. I kept hoping that he wasn't th that complicit in a woman that he truly loves, and, but he's torn by the righteousness of King. Yeah. I mean, it's so complicated, it's so complex, but they, they work so well together. I mean, it's so amazing to see Bobby D and Leo D in, in, this, in this film together. I just realized, Bobby D and Leo D, yeah. Um, but this is your sixth collaboration with Leo and your 11th with Bobby, and you're only three films shy of tying the record with John Ford, who directed John Wayne 14 oh times, my. so you can't quit yet with oh Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> oh my, oh my. <laughs> well, no, I mean with, um, <laughs> no, with Leo, it was six films, it's just that I found that um, we have like minds, so to speak. I mean, there's 30 years difference. Um, and hey, here's the thing, he wasn't afraid to go uh, let me put it this way. He was um, uh, justifiably afraid to go into earnest. In other words, he knew he was walking into the fire in a way because how are we going to play this? It's we, all of us. How are we going to play this guy? You know, he's so weak. Are you, are you ready to, to, to portray somebody like that who, what? He's weak and um, he uh, is pretty much delusional. He really is delusion. He really thinks that, that uh, consciously feels that King Hale, his uncle, would never let harm come to him, or really Molly. Molly may die because of diabetes, whatever, but it's never gonna be come down to that. Subconsciously, he knows it will. And you see it in every frame in his face, Leo, when it, particularly towards the last sequences. He knows, and he keeps going forward um, out, of, out of fear and weakness, sort of like the, the character that in the film I made, Silence, with Kichijiro, yep. the guy who kept um, stepping on the image of Jesus and then coming back and asking the priest to forgive him. And then he rats the priest out to the authorities, and then he goes to the priest and says, forgive me. You know, I kept, I kept thinking, because I, I, I kept trying to hang, I, I wanted to like somebody in that town. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, I loved ev all the Osage, everybody. I wanted to like somebody in the town, and I kept hanging on to how could I like Ernest. And at one point, I kept thinking that Ernest had a similar quality to Lenny Small in Of Mice and Men. Oh, yeah, you know, we got, and, and that we was kind of, that. of my yeah, way yeah, into yeah, Ernest, yeah. In, because in a way, uh, you know, this film and a lot of other films uh, th that you've made kind of you know, force the audience to d rediscover their own moral compass. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm just gonna jump to that question really quickly because I'm interested in that. And that really is that what draws you uh, to men in your movies that are hard to root for? B because as an audience, our moral compass is being tested constantly. 
And in this film, you have two guys who cause us to interrogate ourselves from the very, very beginning. And especially when we start to feel something like hope for Ernest, which I did. And other characters in your films, Jake LaMotta and Travis Bickle and Colin Sullivan, you know, The Departed and, and Henry Hill and Goodfellas, uh, you know, Jordan Belfort and Wolf of Wall Street. The Godfather did this too with the Corleone family very, very successfully. And so my question, Marty, is what is it that attracts you to the dark side of nature, human nature, and then to the justice you deliver in the final scenes of many of your films? Um, I, I just, um, I, I guess it's really, um, after 50 years of all this, and I don't know how else to put it, I, I, I really thought I could be, um, and I mean a director, you know, imagine being in the old studio system and going in and doing different genres and that sort of thing. Instead, I wound up doing pictures that uh, reflect um, the world I came from, pretty much. Um, that doesn't mean that my parents were that way, or they certainly weren't, and um, a lot of my family was not, but I grew up in a world where people who were actually, people like I, I, I uh, accepted as the norm, um, were capable of doing some really heinous things, and some that had no choice, like, you know, uh, uh, some people got involved with robberies or, you know, uh, this is before drugs too, by the way, it's 1949 to 1959. Um, so it's not dealing with drug dealers or whatever, it's something else going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I just knew that a lot of them, to, but deep down they were decent and they had no choice. Um, you say, well, there's a choice, but not necessarily to a lot of people given certain circumstances. Um, for example, there's a mentality, too, that fascinated me. There was a guy, an old story, and Nick Pileggi told me, and, but we know, too, that this happens. There was a guy, there was a feast of San Rocco, and the feast of San Rocco on, on Mott Street, you would walk with um, uh, these uh, votive offerings, like if you had something wrong with your chest, there was a silver, a wax plate of, of your chest or your leg or your arm, which goes back to the ancient Romans. Uh, you would bring these votive offerings to, for the gods to heal, but you'd walk behind the saint down the street, and, in, and one guy would always be walking in this in procession, and he was a great thief, and he would always pray to God for the strength for him to steal more. <laughs> so what does that tell us about who we are as human beings? Hey, you, you know what I'm saying? Right. And so I was fascinated, and um, it's not to be fascinated or to like them. It was... I. Um, I saw the suffering. I just saw the suffering, and I didn't. I don't know what could alleviate it. The 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 church couldn't. Uh, spirituality could. That doesn't mean uh, you know. But the church, the way it was set at that time in those places, was just superficial mm -hmm. for them. Um, I saw a number of a number of them would go to church and uh, participated in the rituals, but uh, you know they lived they lived tough lives. They they were not. And so I, I was, um, the, the suffering around me made me um, constantly analyzing and trying to feel what the hell are we? Who are we? You know, who am I? What am I capable of? Would I be capable if I was living there and these Osage come in and they, they got this money from this oil in which they didn't have to um, really work? And I always say this thing of, um, uh, I guess the European American came in and we come in with a, Christian philosophy to a certain extent of, um, uh, I don't want to minimize it, but it, uh, I don't, I don't want to make that singular and sent there's many different ways, but uh, the Christian thinking, the Protestant thinking of um, uh, the work ethic that, um, you know, you sow and you reap. You do something and you get rewarded by God. Well, these people haven't done anything. And look what they got this oil from. What is this? They don't deserve it. And also, by the way, the money, they don't, know, they don't know how to use it. They don't understand money. Therefore, if I said, you know, if this glass of water is $2, I charge you $2 and you pay it. A week later, I said, you know, make it 3 $3, they pay it. A few weeks later, your wife gets sick, you're tired, da, 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 you're hanging around, you say, the native comes in, you say, you know what, I think I need an extra few bucks. That water now is $10, and they pay it. Well, the wedding photo was forty dollars. Yeah, forty dollars at that time. Yeah. At that and, time, and I think the the dealer said, you know, 
he sold him a Pierce Arrow, and he said, and when you went run out of gas, come back, and I'll sell you yeah, another Pierce, yeah, Pierce yeah. Arrow. Yeah, and that's what yeah. they thought. That's what they explained. Everybody always laughs about that, but the reality was that on those roads, and you know it better than I. You came from Phoenix. I, uh, you know, all I know is that some, they were, in New York, there were a lot of potholes and things. But well, in, yeah, when I was in Phoenix as a kid, there were potholes, and it was dirt. It's yeah, true. Yeah, well, this is, like I mean, Oklahoma. If, you're, if your car, if your, if your um, um, Pierce Arrow gets stuck mm. in the fields, uh, with a with a with a you know a, a, a burst tire, uh, you might as well just go back into town, get another car, and eventually go pick it up, because the road there were no roads, and they also yeah. felt they also felt that they come from that's Native American, the car is a horse, mm -hmm. so you have a corral, okay, and the American the um, the um, European American uh, were appalled they were appalled by this. Right. Look at these beautiful cars. And then they started painting the colors because all the cars were black. And when they started selling to the native uh, Osage, they, ate, they, they were saying, no, we want to uh, make that one this color of the, uh, uh, you know, make that red, make that green. So then they started making color from there, from that point. Marty, t uh, tell us about the moral compass of the whole film for me, and that's the brilliant and mesmerizing Lily Gladstone. Well, can, I, I know I know that when when you met with her, you had a very interesting, memorable first meeting. Can you talk about that? Well, we first met on on Zoom, I believe, and um, I think it was I had seen Ellen Lewis had uh, seen her in um, uh, Certain Women, Kelly Reichardt's film, and um, she showed me uh, the picture. Uh, I felt that uh, she it was an extraordinary performance in that film. I liked the film very much, like Kelly Reichardt's work. Um, and but I, I couldn't re couldn't really meet. We met uh, on Zoom at that time, and so um, uh, Im I immediately sensed that she had the uh, the command of what we needed. She had the gravitas, and she also had a wry sense of humor. Uh, and there's that intelligence factor, which is interesting for 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 uh, how to play this role, you know. And her own activism, I think, in in, uh, in Native American and uh, Native American issues, um, m made me feel very, very excited. Um, the problem was then COVID hit, and everything stopped for a year. You know. Oh, you um, you actually shut down for a year the the, the pre production. Well, but yeah, we hadn't even really started pre production. I don't really remember. I remember that we brought the script. The script we had, um, Paramount wanted to make it. Like a Jim wanted to make it. Jim Yeah, Jim G. Yeah. yeah, Jim G. And so we had the whole Jim's thing Jim's here tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we changed it. So they said, okay, listen, go ahead, do what you're going to do. Apple came in and Paramount uh, came in to um, uh, distribute the film. And so during that period, things were very, very blurry. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know if the film was going to get made, quite honestly. Uh, but we just kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and trying that other version of the script in which... Uh, Leo would play Ernest, right. you know. The key then was to get Leo together with, with uh, Lily. We had to do that on Zoom. And, uh, you know, it, it was like, oh, it's really important we should do face-to-face. -face. No, we got to do it on a Zoom. Immediately when we finished the Zoom, Leo buzzed me right back, said, she's great. <laughs> 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 We've got to do it. And I said, no, no, absolutely. But the thing with, with um, when Lily, uh, she's here, I think, is... is um, uh, I relied in, on her greatly, and I relied on her as a um, conduit um, to the Native Americans, uh, to Osage, to all of them around. And um, even to the point when she was learning the Osage, by the way, a lot of the Osage language is lost, but they were, they're putting it back together, so to speak. And there was a teacher, Chris, and he was teaching her, and they taught Leo, too. Mm. And also Bob De Niro, who, uh, who liked it so much, he wanted to do most of the film in Osage. And I said, no, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Bob, you got it. Uh, no, but this is great language. Just, I said, no, I know, I know. Uh, yeah, but it, it's uncle, you know, it's, it's yeah. anyway. Uh, it, but, but she um, would uh, hear stories from Chris, for example, um, a story about the uh, coyote in the whirlwind. Uh, which is a, a folk story of the, the Osage, in which uh, the whole idea of calling um, Leo's character Ernest the, the coyote, coyote yeah. you know, and, and the scene in the car, for example, he's driving her, he's a taxi driver, and she's, she uh, 
speaks in Osage, and he says, oh, what are you saying? And she continues speaking Osage. He goes, well, I don't know what it was, but it must be Indian for handsome devil. <laughs> and that was an improv, and she, she really reacts, laughter, yeah. and that's genuine. And that's, I think, that moment on screen is you could see the relation between not only Ernest and Molly, but also uh, Leo and Lily. Yeah. And how, how they just go from that moment and then sort of trusting each other in these scenes uh, and working off each other. But many of the suggestions came through Lily and came through uh, Chad Renfro and came through all, all the people who were working uh, with the Osage in front of the camera and behind the camera. Yeah, because, you know, Lily was able to, with just a glance or just a look away, she had such an inner life and an inner monologue. I could almost read her mind about how she was feeling about, about you know, Ernest and about her sisters and and her fear that Anna was going to go too far one day. And 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 I also think the the supporting players, just the faces of the entire supporting cast. The sisters are all incredible. The mom is amazing. Yeah. Um, but but you cast locals a lot of the time also, and you also yeah. had some performing artists like Sturgill Simpson and Charlie Musselwhite was Charlie in the Musselwhite? movie. Yeah. Uh, but they all look not of our time. You know, it looks like you and Ellen Lewis, the casting director, got into a time machine and went back into the 20, early 20th century Sturgeon to Simpson cast the movie. With his um, Stetson hat, man, it was great, you know? It, it, was, it was amazing. And who is the leader of the Osage Tribal Council of the 25 original families and that amazing monologue he has. Well, yeah, yeah. That, 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 I was crying in that scene. That's that Everett, was extraordinary. Everett, uh, Everett uh, Waller. Uh, he is that way, Steve. That's the way he is. And he's a big guy. <laughs> and I go up to him, I reach like his chest, you know, basically. Uh, Everett, you want to, yes, I'll do anything you say, sir. You know, and then it was like, it's your world. Just tell me what you want. Okay, Everett, if you come over here, yeah. Uh, all right, and, and the other guy is Yancey Redcorn. Right. Uh, he plays Chief Bunnycastle. But what happened that day, it was, uh, there was the dialogue from Yancey talking about, well, two people of our, tr our group has been killed. We're going to send Barney McBride to, New York, to uh, Washington, D.C., and all this going on. And it sounded, so, I, it sounded like so much exposition, but not in a good way. I didn't, even though it was based on the actual council, and what they said that day, I felt kind of, I don't know, I, I, I felt uncomfortable. So I, it was very hot, and I walked, I told, I asked Everett, because I knew he would do it, I said, I need uh, a cutaway of some of the faces of the, the people listening to uh, the, the council. Could you just do some off-camera for me? By that point, I, I, I became uh, more, um, uh, he was approachable. Because he got to know me a little bit. He was approachable. He was less intimidating. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, uh-huh. He just looked at me. Said, uh -huh. And all of a sudden, I walk out, and I hear this noise. And De Niro comes running out. I said, you see what's going on in there? And I go back in, and he is haranguing off camera the, uh, the group of people uh, for reactions. And as soon as he stopped, I said, do it again, but only seated. Could you? He said, I think I can. And he sat down, I put two cameras down, and that was it. He went on. He improvised Improvised that. all of it. He improvised all of it. You know, the babies, uh, we, we, rode, we rode our warriors over the dead babies. You know, the Osage are dying. Do not let them die alone. And then the final line, which, which is, always moves me to tears, but he says, we didn't ask for the, for the great life. We just asked for life. <laughs> we just asked for life. Is oh. And that did it. We all froze. That's the scene. That's amazing. You know. That's amazing. But I think he speak, He speaks for all. Uh, and when he when he when he when he uh, uh, when he uh, goes on like that, and uh, yeah. and then he has a wonderful thing. Goes, thank you, Chief. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> well, that's uh, Walla, Walla, yeah, and, 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 or Everett. But he couldn't come to the uh, he couldn't come to the uh, can screenings and everything. He's uh, couldn't take the flying. I think. Um, just quickly, because I'm getting a, a, a little rap signal, but I want to talk a little bit about some of the imagery of your film. You know, you know Lizzie's mom uh, and Lizzie both are visited by the harbinger of death, the owl, in both of those scenes. There's, there's this imagery in this that, that I'll never shake off. Um, I think one of the most beautiful things, uh, uh, images in the movie, is where when Lizzie dies, her ancestors come to escort her from this world and into the next. 
And then all of a sudden you see, when you cut back and she's, she's gone and the family's around her. I mean, there's images like the little girl walking across the top of the coffin, the tradition. The, what, what do the two apples mean? Well, that's the food for the, um, for the deceased. Mm -hmm. Just a symbolic thing. But we found out, again, through Marianne Bauer, who was my associate producer, my archivist for many years, uh, she was trying to keep it all straight because I kept, we actually, um, uh, after Eric and I made the different passes of the script, we kept working every day and changing and writing and changing and writing, and she would keep it all straight for me. You know, you're repeating yourself here. That is, right. This is not accurate with the Osage. But she found out that uh, the uh, the funerals of the, uh, the burial of the eldest uh, part of the ritual is to have the youngest of the family walk on the coffin. I said, oh, we've got to have that. I had, never, I had never seen that before. Yeah, and, and there I, were more I, things like that, Steve, that I tried to put in. I, I got in as many as I could. I love the afraid lights to prevent murder from yeah, happening that, to actual, the homes. That's real. That's real. And that's all real, yeah, that's the afraid real. lights. The thing about the, um, the beauty, I felt, of um, Lizzie's passing is she is taken home by her ancestors and she's taken home by her mother and father who are standing there. Yeah. That day we shot it, it was, the weather was beautiful and we're just sitting out there and I took, saw them take her and move her out down and I said that's the way, that's the way we should all go yeah. in a sense. And the whole crew felt it and it was so beautiful, wow. you know. I have to ask you, Marty, did Bobby D really break the paddle on Leo's ass? I think he did. Did you see it he break? Did, yeah. You see oh, it crack? Yeah, he deserved it. And Leo fell off the thing? He, for real. And it was cracked. You yeah, saw yeah, it, he right? Broke, yeah. He said it broke. I said, that's fine. Was it a happy accident? No, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fine. He should have broken it. It should have really, it should have been flying or something. I said, no, it's fine. Just leave him on the floor now, you know. Oh, God. Well, we wanted to get the things, that the, the, the ritual of the Osage. I also wanted to have the ritual of the European. And part of that was um, KKK, um, all right, doesn't always have to be negative uh, also, it just happened to be, um, uh, and also the Masons. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, part of that was a kind of uh, almost like um, a frat boy hazing situation where uh, it was an infantile, uh, infant uh, infantil uh, to, in, um, a kind of infantile um, mm -hmm. uh, action in a way. Uh, uh, like treating him like a child. Um, uh, and so for me, I, I try to get, I did more Masonic stuff, but I couldn't get it in the film the right yeah, way. Yeah, I did, because that was out of nowhere when that happened. And it was all about, you have to handle your woman. You don't, you're not handling her the way we need to. She's going to DC and you let her. And, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was shocking, it was amazing. I did, the final question, Marty, and I could go on. Obviously, we could all sit here for a long time, because I, I love this so much, talking to you about your movie. Um, how did you come up with the brilliant epilogue of the Lucky Strike Radio Hour, and, and, and what were you intending? Well, the thing was that uh, it's... Mm, from, the, from, the, um, from, the, uh, uh, from the book, it's the uh, birth of the FBI, right? And so <clears throat> the FBI needed propaganda. And so they, w they went on radio. And I grew up listening to radio before we had TV. So I listened to gangbusters and shows like that. And I thought, well, oh, wouldn't it be great? This thing, all this, all this has happened. People have died, tragedy, suffering, you know, uh, anguish, and all this. And it became a radio show. It became a radio show. So, well, for the FBI, yes, but it became a radio show, you know? And in a sense, it became entertainment. Um, uh, and we, yeah, again, it's my own, I'm not accusing anyone, but the point is, it's my own belief of being complicit in that, enjoying the entertainment. And even this film is entertainment in that sense. I try, I try, you know what I mean? I try to make it, I try to make it as truthful as possible, as honest, I should say, as possible. Um, and, and therefore, I said, we have to end it with one of those radio shows where you see, after all this, that's what the American public was led to, led to think of or believe of the situation. And in the middle of the show, it suddenly becomes an epilogue because if it's really 1936 in, in a radio studio, what is he telling you? How could you be, how could the narr how could the announcer know that um, um, uh, 
Bill Hale died at the age of 87. You follow, suddenly it's, you, suddenly you make a little trick and move on. And then we had the obit, and I felt that um, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know if I could direct the actor to do that. And having lived with the Osage and everybody there in Oklahoma for so long, I felt I had to try it myself. We, we're lucky SAG settled or we couldn't have been talking. I know. On the stage tonight. I know. I got a little bit of a waiver for that, I heard, but because only 36 seconds. But I said, listen, let me, let me do it. If it doesn't work, I know the angle. I can get another actor to do it. But as I was doing it, I kind of felt it. And, uh, and I also felt that, in a way, you know, as I say, my own complicity in life and, and um, uh, the world as it exists, uh, uh, trying to have compassion for those who are suffering in the world. That's all. Well. You are the master of our medium, and this is your masterpiece, Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh.